without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Simon Thomas. Yeah, hearing the doctor bit never gets old, actually. It's, uh, I normally say it for bank managers. Um, I'll be honest, I'm standing up here as proposedly an expert on, on Mako Shark, and I've, I've never caught one. I have, though, in my life been very privileged to actually see two jumping off the coast of the southwest. Um, one in about 1985 and another one about 12 years ago. Um, they had two things, in, one thing in common, they were above me at the time when I saw them, which is pretty, if, if it hasn't got a long tail and it's above you, it's a Mako. Um, the first one I saw was probably in the region of 800 pound and at the time it was going through a shoal of mullet off the manacles. I was crewing at the time for a sadly departed skipper out of Falmouth and as we were going past the manacles we saw this thing appear above us and it became very obvious very quickly it was a mako and what it was doing there was at the time you get these massive shoals of mullet that appear off the manacles before they go up the estuaries and this mako was coming clean out of the water, back flipping into the mullet and just cruising round very gently, picking them off the surface. And um, as it did so, it came over to pay us a visit, so I went straight past the boat and we're like, oh, this is nice. Uh, we had the gear on board to land it. Um, unfortunately, we had eight people from the north of England, I think it's from the north of England, who were dead set on filling their boats with a whitefish. And despite our pleading and begging and the fact you'll never see one again, they'd rather go fishing for pollock. So um, we uh, eventually had to pull off this thing as I'm practically hand feeding it, which both of us, myself and the skipper, were nearly crying. Um, but in revenge, we took them to the biggest, snaggiest wreck we could find and made them lose all their gear all day, which was a great pleasure to the lot of us. Now, as I said, I'm no, by no means an expert on Mako, but I do happen to know one, and Tim will bear, bear me out on this. So I'm going to give you a quote from Keith Poe. Now, Keith has probably tagged more thousand pound plus makos than anyone else on the planet probably knows more about them um, he's fished both in the gulf of california and also in the atlantic ocean for them and he does a lot of satellite tagging now normally he use uh, um he uses um spot tags which go on the fin and only down low when the fin goes above the surface but in, i tried to get um an auto speak thing on my thing and I managed to get two very lovely American voices both female but it just didn't quite sound right now I've got my darling wife who's going to read out his words of wisdom which were basically how he finds the things which probably are as pertinent over here as they are there um, a she doesn't have a Californian accent but but Tracy's more you know is very good at public speaking so Tracy take me away this is Keith Poe's words I have fished in three different oceans from Aco sharks Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Gulf of California, and have had over 5,000 to my boat in the Pacific. I have used some of the same basic principles in the Atlantic and the Gulf of California with great success. Temperature, 16 Celsius and upwards. Find the fish. Figure out where they're, what they're eating and where they're located. Attract the fish chum with whatever they're looking for. The great thing about the conservation tag and release program is data that will potentially open new fisheries. I have a 12 foot Mako on a satellite tag right now, giving live updates every time its dorsal breaks the surface and it reports the position to the satellite and then onto the app. She's a thousand miles offshore heading back to my location and I will know exactly when and where she is and many more will be following in the same conditions for the same food supply. While this information is amazing it's not necessary. I can look at the ocean temperature, go offshore and find what I know she likes to eat, Californian sea lions and start chumming in that area, it's only a matter of time till they show up. No, I'm taking from that that Keith doesn't actually chum with Californian sea lions, but <laughs> he does chum with them, does he? Okay. I'm not sure that's strictly allowed, but it goes back to the old Frank Muntz days. The injured ones, and then he's got a big freezer on them. Oh, he actually does use them, yeah. I don't know if any of you have ever read Frank, Frank Muntz's book about shark fishing, but one of the things he used to use for chum was porpoise. That was his favourite. Yeah, yeah. Ground porpoise. 
Now, grinding a porpoise doesn't sound very attractive to me and certainly wouldn't go down well these days. Grind and release. Yeah, grind and release is about right, yeah. I'm sure that's something else, but we'll go into that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it does highlight what really is common a lot, a, along a lot, a lot of shark species. Uh, find out the temperature they like, very important for blue sharks as well. Um, figure out where that temperature is, then find, then find what they're eating. Um, then try and imitate that with your chum. That's a pretty good basic principle for anything. Makos are much more difficult than blue sharks, obviously, so they're so damn rare. Um, just as a treat, though, I will give you... There's a picture here of one of his sharks. So, I don't know if you can make this one out. It's not as clear as it could be, but the tail's up here somewhere, and the head's on the left-hand side. That is a 1,500-pound Mako, um, which is actually putting a spot tag into the dorsal fin. Just like leaning into the boat one hand. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done that with pea sets. It's, not, it's, it's easier on a mako than it is with a blue, funny enough, because I'd imagine because police just squirm all over the place. But he's done this to a lot of fish, and he's probably contributed more to our understanding of makos than the other person, which is pretty impressive. Now, anyway, I'll have to include this. Um, one of the things I'm including at the top is the Pat Smith database, which I'm a, um, I'm a joint founder of with John over there. Um, and I just mentioned we're currently doing a, um, a shark project where we're actually collecting mucus and several of the skippers here will actually be doing it. Basically swab a shark, um, we'll store it and then we'll do DNA analysis later. Um, I've got to mention I'm currently employed by the University of York and I'm very likely to be employed by the Marine Biology Association in Plymouth very soon, but that's another story. So my talk's going to concentrate on mako sharks. And they are literally the, su the supercharged apex predator of the ocean. Um, they're known as the peregrine falcon of the ocean. They are very, very quick. Which, when you consider you're actually trying to swim through a viscous media, is quite a trick. The sharp end. Now, we've got a really good illustration of this. Now, make those sharp... You can feel on the teeth here. You could probably get away with fluorocarbon for a medium-sized mako. Um, these teeth are not designed to cut, they're designed to grasp. You see by the unique design of them, they also look pretty fragile. Now, one of the interesting things about makos is they've got very particular design of teeth, designed, as I said before, for grabbing, but they actually contain a high content of iron, um, which actually strengthens them. And they're very popular. Fossil teeth, believe it or not, is a big thing in America. And fossil mako teeth are one of the most interesting ones for them, because of the, the iron colour that you get to them. You can see all the way down that mouth, you're not coming out. If he grabs hold of you, you're not coming back out again. Um, the teeth look incredibly fragile, but aren't as fragile as they look at. You also note the size of the eye. Um, Mako sharks are actually more reliant on sight than a lot of other sharks. They actually have one of the biggest brains of all fish. Um, unlike most sharks, they don't rely as much on the electroreception. They use uh, sound, they use vibrations, and they use their amazing eyesight to actually prey fish. They're, they're a classic to prey on fish. They're a classic ambush hunter. Here's what they do best. This is what we all. This is how I've seen makos, and this is anyone who's seen makos out of here probably seen exactly the same. One's up there. It's a mako. Um, to actually do this requires an awful lot of power. Um, if you can imagine the force required to actually run up through the water column and then bring yourself a body length or two out of the water. That shows you the strength of these creatures. And I'll go on a bit later into how they actually achieve this. Oh, we'll do a battery change, have I? Okay. Okay, distribution. Um, basically, anywhere above 16 degrees C across the world, they are found. They're never numerous, but they occur anywhere from New Zealand, the same species as the short fin mako, all the way up to sort of northwest of Scotland they've been found, but commonest places they are actually found include the eastern seaboard of the Atlantic, as you can see from the map down the bottom there, they're commonly fished for and commonly, um, commonly caught, but they're not necessarily the biggest of the fish. The really large ones that Keith had are often off the Gulf of California in the Pacific. Again, there is hot spots for them on Australia and around New Zealand, but they're also found on, on the Horn of Africa and places like that. It, it's more interesting some of the places they're not found, as by the yellow marks you can see there, because often there are quite lump numbers of blue sharks in those areas, but they actually, res uh, actually represent low nutrient areas. So probably the sh blue sharks cross them because they have to, the mako being warm-blooded really doesn't want to go r anywhere near an area where it's got to uh, expend a lot of energy and not actually eat a lot. 
as I said, big fish are really rare in the in the Eastern Atlantic. Um, the European mako fishery, it's, it is calculated, if they stop fishing for makos commercially now, it would take 50 years for the stock to recover. And they're not stopping commercially fishing for them. Mako flesh, unusually for sharks, is valued. Um, it's not like blue sharks that are actually caught as a bycatch and the fins are worth a little bit. Mako is actually directly targeted. Um, as part of the blue shark catch, but is very much valued. They're also, they're often ca ca caught in quite large numbers on the long lines for the swordfish. Um, makos have never been common in the UK. Um, as you were saying, you know, there are skippers, I fished with a skipper called Nigel Hunt out of Falmouth once, and he used to have himself as a mako skipper, and I said, well, how many you caught? Oh, none. Uh, <laughs> So I think he was a skipper as and he went he fished the areas where there were actually makos rather than actually ever caught them. But um, I think the most ever caught in the summer by a single skipper was around three fish, wasn't it? Three fish, Robin Vinicum. Yeah, and I talked to Rose, I talked to Robin back in the day. And Ray Pengelly did it as well. Yeah. That uh, those three fish that Ray caught that year were very, very small juvenile fish. Yeah, it's interesting because yeah. um, my impression is that a lot of the makos were actually caught early on in the year, weren't they, Ian? Yeah, the best month was uh, well, the best months were June and July. Yeah. And then it sort of died off until as you went through the season. So you got the odd uh, few in August, and then by the time September come along, there was even less. You know, just one or two fish in September. So interesting, and they actually weren't in our waters, or at least we didn't catch them in our waters during the highest sea surface temperatures. We caught them probably just as they crossed that 16 degree barrier. Yeah, and George George Shallop, she had hers in May. Yeah. So they probably was there earlier on in. Yeah, and that was 14. I mean, Joyce Yallop's fish, as we read in the book, was uh, coughed up a congreel beside the boat, didn't it? 50 pounder. Yeah, so it was apparently supposed to have weighed 500, wasn't it? Officially weighed, so was it a 500 or a, 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 a slightly pounds. a slightly vomity so, 50 so that, pounder? That the shark itself weighed 500 pounds. Yeah. The congreel had been ejected before they weighed it. So Incredible. It's, 500 pounds. it's irrelevant. It's, it's, it's amazing fish, though, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. are. Oh, to eat a congreel takes some. But just well, shows you the variety. Most of the, most of the makos, while you're on it, most of the makos that were caught off of Cornwall, when they opened them up, nearly all of them had conger eels in them. So it just shows you they were, um, you know, something something big, you just chew down the body, that's it, swallow it whole. Yeah, probably quite unique in having the ability to actually do that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, worldwide distribution, but never common. Um, even, I think, probably New Zealand and the eastern, eastern seaboard of America is where you've got your best chance of catching them. Yeah. Um, till 1980 they were regularly seen, I would say, late 70s. Um, yeah. I saw one in 85, but there hadn't been one caught out of Falmouth for, I think, at least six years before that. Um, I saw another one off Plymouth about 12 years ago, but it was a small fish and just an isolated one. But there have been other reports. Um, I think 2014 was Andy Griffith's fish, wasn't it? 2013. 2013. And there was the big one, wasn't there? In Ireland, off of the south coast of Ireland. Yep same year and Andy had his in the uh, um, off of Wales. Off of Milford the very big one, the, the very big one from the Celtic Deeps, it's yeah. very unlikely that was actually a European fish. The size of that fish would indicate it probably crossed the Atlantic. Um, these fish aren't just aren't caught in any size off Europe anymore. Yeah. So it was probably like our big blue sharks would probably actually come across the, from, the, yeah. from the other side of the pond. How fast are they actually? Well that's a really good question. I mean, why are they fast? Um, they have to be to catch their prey. Predominantly, in most areas it's been found, they, they feed on very fast moving te teleos fish, so bony fish, um, from mackerel, sauries, from tuna, and even billfish. They'll quite happily predate on billfish. So one thing in common with all those species, they're quick. So makos being a classic ambush hunter have to be capable of quick bursts of speed. Now how fast? Well, it's calculated, that should be miles per hour, that a burst speed of 21 miles per hour would actually be need, needed to obtain escape velocity to leap that high. So they at least go 21 miles an hour. Now blue sharks are thought to do that. There are some studies that have indicated, that indicated they can reach up to 60 miles an hour, which is an absolutely ridiculous speed. Though some of those might well be influenced by the fact they were actually seen following boats. So there may be some sort of slipstreaming effect there. It, it is thought though, it is calculated a big maker could probably reach 40 to 45 miles an hour without too much problems. But they can't do this for long. Now, how do they manage to go so quick? Well, they thermoregulate. 
much like a tuna does and much like we do, we can actually re regulate our body temperature. Now, it's a, it's a bit of a um, mutation in, um, in me metabolism that allows us to do that, but basically it's your metabolism isn't working as efficiently, so some of the, um, the, the energy you get from food is actually turned into heat. Um, they also have a very good way of actually um, using that to make sure that cold blood comes across the gills, chills off very quickly, is effectively countercurrented by warm blood coming from deep, in, deep within the fish. So effectively, they've got a radiator. Um, a mako shark swimming in 20 degrees C of water will have a core temperature about 27 degrees C. Um, so it can raise its, its core temperature at least seven degrees above ambient. It's thought that in colder water they can probably do it a bit more, but very much is regulated by food. The more they eat, the more they can regulate the temperature. And as a consequence of this, they have to eat a lot more as, the, uh, as this energy is weighted at heat, and it's calculated about four to six percent of the body weight is required each day for a mako shark. So that's quite a high energy intake. You can play that to something like a blue that would be in the region of one percent. So, they can thermoregulate. Paw beagles can also do it. They're, they're another laminid shark. Now, paw beagles use this ability mainly, rather than to go really quickly, they use it to go into colder water. So they use it as, as a competitive advantage to go into much colder water than other sharks. They can still maintain their, their core temperature above that of the ambient seawater. Um, Makos actually use this to enhance their ability to, to, to within what we consider normal territory for sharks. They don't tend to go into very cold water. Um, they actually tend to actually use it as a way of hunting better. And as a consequence of this, they are very quick. Why? Well, they have two sorts of muscles, red muscle and white muscle. Um, you can think of red muscle as sort of the slow twitch muscle, the muscle that does the donkey work. So if you're cruising, a mako shark will respire using oxygen. Um, and these muscles, depending on when they are, will generate and retain heat. Now these muscles don't contract very slowly, but are really, really good for stamina. Um, it requires a lot of oxygen, and it's, su it's suited very well for long distance swimming. So if you're migrating somewhere, they primarily use these muscles to migrate. Um, and as I said, they, they actually play the most crucial ro role in the mako shark's ability to swim continuously without tiring out. They're obligate ram ventilators, they can't stop. A blue shark can actually pump water across its gills, a mako shark doesn't have that ability. White muscles in contrast, very fast twitch. Now, they actually don't use oxygen, they, they respire anaerobically and the process to produce lactic acid, which builds up quite rapidly. As they, don't, as they don't require oxygen, they're not actually restricted by how quickly we can get oxygen into us, but they are used for these rapid, very rapid, quick bursts of speed. They exhaust very quickly um, due to the build up of lactic acid, much as we would get, well, it was used to be thought we used to get when we get a stitch. So over the 12 seconds or so of a burst, you'll build up the lactic acid. You'll then need oxygen to actually get rid of this lactic acid afterwards. The other thing that contributes to them is their unique biology. As you can see from that, they've got a moon-shaped tail. Um, there actually isn't a lot of, of asymmetry between the top and bottom lobes. They're capable of producing an awful lot of thrust. Now, makos have a particularly unique way of controlling the, muscu the muscles in their caudal fin, and they can actually manipulate the angle and stiffness of this fin to increase the amount of thrust they produce. Um, but they've got a really neat trick that as the tail reaches the midline, they can actually flick a bit of extra energy into it. So effectively, you produce more power, but also more of these micro vortices that reduce drag. So basically, you've got two forces, lift and thrust, now, with lift, sharks swim primarily horizontally, though these little babies can shoot out of the water. Lift, lift is, effect, is effectively a horizontal movement. And thrust provided by this incredible tail. And we've also, but we've also got some other adaptions to this sort of thing. This is actually an electron micrograph of the denticles. So unlike traditional fish, sharks have denticles, which are effectively baby teeth. The whole skin is covered by these tiny little teeth. Now these little fellas here are incredible because they're effectively 
they are called low, pro low profile vortex generators and these serve to actually create these micro vortices across the skin surface which reduces drag and helps to increase lift. Now not only do they vary in shape and size across the body and the fins to maximise lift, they can actually move them individually to slightly different angles across the body as they swim in different ways. And as I said, tail velocity is aided by muscular input at midpoint of stroke, but it's also aided you know, by them actually changing the amount of drag they have in the water by adjusting the, the denticles on their tails, which is a pretty neat trick. It's, this is a study by Waller in 2023, which is actually one of the few studies done on sharks. Now, the way they did them, they fitted, um, they fitted me uh, um, devices to actually measure how quickly the tail was beating, but also um, how much heat was generated whilst they were doing this. So they actually swim quite quickly for um, their, um, their actual cruise speed is about two mile an hour, a little bit quicker than a blue shark. And at that, they'll be uh, beating their tail about about once every two seconds, something like that. Now, the maximum burst speed of the Mako was, in this particular two metre individual, was just over 11 mile an hour. But at that speed, it was beating its tail 3.65 3 times per second, which is pretty impressive. But this burst was only ever, ever sustained for 14 seconds and actually varied throughout. And actually the mean speed of that burst was 5.23. So what we're actually looking at is a real cheetah, something that can go incredibly quickly for short periods of time. Whilst it was doing this, the, the temperature in the, in the white muscles actually, actually was raised by about 0.24 degrees, which doesn't sound much, but for 12 seconds of activity. And this continued for about 12 and a half minutes after that burst of, of activity. So you're actually seeing they actually take a while to recover. They can also, the other adaption they have is they have a particular design of their gills which allows them to absorb a lot of oxygen very quickly whilst they're travelling. For those of those of a medical background, I'm assuming in the corner, the, the basal metabolic rate was actually measured at about 185 milligram of oxygen per kilogram per litre per hour. And that was at 18 degrees C. Now that's, that's pretty high for, be higher than any other shark. So effectively they can metabolise, they can actually generate power better than any other shark that's ever been measured. But interestingly, after these bursts of activity, they glide. So they use this ability to have very low drag and generate thrust very easily by actually recovering to get their lactic acid levels down again by gliding. So even though they might have these bursts of activity, they then have to recover. You can imagine if you hook one, he jumps 10 times, he's going to take a little while to recover after that. And as gliding is thought, or well, the author's thought, it actually was an energy recovery mechanism, and it probably makes sense. So effectively, you can reduce your core temperature, and you can just get your lactic acid levels down again as you recover. So, in summary, they're a fast fish because they feed on fast prey. Makes perfect sense. The internal heat generation and maintenance increases the mus muscle efficiency within these fish. They have a very high me metabolic rate, and as a result of which, need to eat a lot. So if you're eating a lot of very fast fish, it sort of goes around in a circle. You have to go fast to catch them, and then you have to eat a lot of them to do it. Their body is absolutely incredible. It is designed to maximise thrust and reduce drag, even down to the point that these individual little teeth-like things on their skin that, that they have instead of scales are actually evolved to produce reduced drag. And it allows them to go potentially a lot faster than the shark should be able to and it's now being adapted for various surfaces to try and um, to try and actually be used in engineering circumstances to reduce drag they also have a, it was also calculated that the shape of their fins is actually so efficient to do exactly the same purpose they've evolved fins and you can see they're very different from a blue shark in both shape and power but again it's to reduce drag and increase thrust but they are in effect an ambush predator, but they're an ambush predator that has to travel a long distance to find their prey. So they travel, then they'll ambush them. So they need to be able to go a long distance, and then find, once they go their prey, they have to go incredibly quickly, because anyone who wants to hunt a marlin has got to go fast. So I think that actually is the end of my talk, and thank you for listening, and in a minute we'll have some questions, I think, after we've done the yeah, thing. Well done, Sam.